the world is going to become more compliant. Every year, its options are being closed down. Residence programs are becoming more expensive. Tax residence options are going away. Citizenships and naturalization are becoming more difficult. You know, company registers are opening up. Banks want more documentation. FATCA, now CRS, it's a growing list up to 110 uh, countries now in 2020. The world has changed. And so for the people who think, I'm just going to hang out in Bali 12 months a year, they don't really know that, when, uh, that I'm here. And they all attack. Okay, good luck with that. Good, no, seriously, I mean, good, good luck with that. This hiding, how are they going to know? What should they? It's over. It's over. We stand today. The Business Method with The Shadow. The Business Method. The Business Method Podcast. The Business Method Podcast featuring Chris Reynolds. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics for location independence. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm your host, Chris Reynolds, and welcome to the Business Method Podcast, a podcast featuring successful entrepreneurs and high-profile people dissecting their business models. We dissect the different methods, tools, and tactics of high-performance online entrepreneurs and high-caliber people in a series format. On our first series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs in 100 days that have built businesses creating $100,000 or more annually. On our second series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs that have built location-independent businesses that produce over a million dollars in annual revenue. And now we're interviewing 100 major influencers to get behind the minds and the science of using influence to grow business and influence income results, economies, and cultures. There's a growing number of people building these caliber of businesses like this, and we're going to figure out what it takes to make this happen now let's jump in today's show the business method today listeners my good friend and co-host noah lath and i get to interview the founder and ceo of nomad capitalist andrew henderson andrew joins us on the mic to chat about how he legally reduced his global tax rate from 43 percent to one percent no joke Andrew has had quite a bit of success as an entrepreneur from a very young age, and when his businesses hit eight figures, he realized that the tax checks he was writing to the government were getting pretty large. Andrew then started out on a journey to save those taxes legally to maximize his wealth. Throughout the show, we also get to ask Andrew about some of the best overseas investments, second residencies and citizenships, banking around the world, how to maximize on the nomadic lifestyle, and how to build influence along the way. It's another fun episode, guys, and without further ado, let's welcome Andrew to the show. Entrepreneur systems, methods, tools, and tactics. And listeners, we want to welcome Andrew Henderson to the show. Andrew, how are you doing today, my friend? Doing great. Happy to be with you. Yeah, it's great to have you on the show and welcome. And we also have our co-host Noah Lath on the show. Noah, how's it going, buddy? I'm feeling great, my friend. So this is a great example of the nomad life uh, that Andrew is going to talk about more. But I'm calling in from Chiang Mai, Thailand. Andrew is in Malaysia and Noah is in Barcelona. I think it's incredible that we can have people from... So from all over the world call in, we record a podcast and have a great show and pick each other's brains while we're at it. But Andrew, I want to welcome you to the show. I've known about you and your reputation for quite a while now and heard some amazing things. And I was reading your bio and read more about you just before the show and kind of getting to know your story, which is pretty exciting. But from what I gather is that you became pretty successful at a young age, got your business up to eight figures and just flat out got annoyed that you were paying so much in taxes. So uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to just give you the mic for a couple of minutes and start out maybe there about start around that area of your life when you hit that eight figures and you realized, hey, look how much I'm, uh, I'm paying in taxes. How can I stop this? Yeah, I mean, it was a collective or a cumulative uh, number, but we were doing a, a pretty brisk business regardless. Um, and you know, it's interesting because when I grew up, I thought I had it all figured out. I mean, that's that's the funny thing that I see is what gets in people's way is they, no matter what it is, they think they have it all figured out. And uh, as I sit here uh, this week with a guy who has about $100 million and everyone else who's in that ultra high net worth camp, they're the guys who realize that even then they don't have it figured out. But I thought I had it all figured out. Uh, as a kid that, hey, you know, taxes are not what you want to do, big libertarian but then suddenly, you know, I went out there and um, 
it wasn't even when the business has got, got fully up and running. Cause then I was more aware of it. I was working on it. I was kind of starting this nomad thing for myself, but it's like, Oh yeah, I made 200 grand. And then you forget like, you know, you're not in the real world yet. Um, in your first year in business where it's like, Oh yeah, I got to pay. <laughs> uh, and you just don't really realize how that works. And you have all these kind of theoretical conceptions of how that works, but nothing can prepare you for that than just writing a check. Uh, and having to send that money in. And so the numbers got bigger over time. And, you know, in one sense, it's just like, well, that's the price of doing business. You kind of become numb to it. Now, the other sense, you, you say this is ridiculous. And, you know, how I kind of let my energy flow was I just traveled and got away from the madness. Um, I started traveling more and more and more and more to build connections, both on a personal level and on a kind of business and learning level. Uh, in other countries trying to figure out, you know, how I could solve this. And ultimately I realized that the best thing for me to do uh, was just to kind of totally reset and become this global citizen and, and sell the businesses in the U S um, and, and just make an exit and, and just start fresh and, and vow that never again would I put myself in that position. Uh, and so that's what I did. And um, you know, it's, it's interesting the way that you ask it because channeling the energy uh, into you know going overseas was my form of action. It wasn't maybe the best course of action. It got me there eventually, um, but it just made me feel better about the fact that wow, I'm looking for the replacement. Um, in reality, I think that I could have done a lot more at that time to make progress and to solve the problem and to keep more of my own money. Uh, but hindsight is twenty twenty, and so when someone comes to me today. I apply that same kind of discipline to them and helping them avoid the mistakes that I made. So I think that's important. What was the, the like, it's very interesting what, what you're saying. And I'm curious, like, what was that tipping point that made you decide, okay, not more, let me go and find a solution? Yeah, I think that, it wasn't one tipping point. It was um, kind of a series of, of pent up frustration. I'm trying to think, yeah, what was the tipping point? Because I've told this story before. There was a time when I was still in my first business. I, I ran a few things concurrently. I had some businesses that were more active. Others were just kind of passive and I ran them and I had people running them. Um, but I was in the radio business, which was kind of like consulting. And we had, you know, it was my, my, you know, early experiments with overseas workers. And I'm just like, yeah, I could put this, you know, outside of the United States. But I would call, I remember I, I told the story, I called like a guy who could have helped me with the whole tax part. I was brand new to it back then. And I refused to pay him. It was like $15,000, which was funny because I then went and wrote like a much bigger check, um, mm -hmm. less than 90 days later. And that was like the quarterly check. Um, and somehow, you know, I was less angry about just sending that check because that's just what you do than paying someone to solve the problem. Um, and so I guess eventually the tipping point was just, hey, I feel really comfortable overseas. Um, I figured out, you know, kind of what to do on my own. Certainly, again, it was kind of theoretical at first, but I knew enough to be dangerous. And it just was like, you know what, I'm just going to totally change the whole system. So, you know, for me, I never got the full benefit of doing it with, for example, that kind of consulting, using that term to simplify a business, I could have done much better. Um, but I think that for me, it was kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater was like the total solution uh, that I ended up with. And, um, you know, it could have been done much better. We, we don't know what we don't know. Usually, yeah. I think, I mean, here, here's the thing, right? I mean, going overseas going offshore is scary. I, mean, I, 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 I had an Australian guy who does Amazon FBA tell me, you know, we're taught in Australia, you don't invest in other cities in Australia. You invest in your city. Like forget yeah. investing in some other country, forget going to some other country. I mean, going to some other country is you go to Bali for a week or, you know, yeah. you're in Ireland if you're from the U S or, you know, whatever you go to Mexico. Um, and so, you know, I think that now versus then, you know, 10 years ago, people are more understanding of, you know, digital nomad lifestyle, perpetual traveler bouncing around. Back then it wasn't as well documented. And it's kind of like, well, gee, like, how is this all going to work? 
Um, there was no nomad capitalist back then. And it's so it kind of, I had to kind of ease my way into feeling comfortable that this stuff was even doable. And so part of my mission now is reaching people who would never otherwise think about this it, and, and, you know, reaching entrepreneurs who just want to keep more of their money, put it back to use, grow their businesses rather than the people who are the 14 year old me, which is the uber libertarian who just doesn't want to pay because they don't want the government to waste it. The reality is that uh, it took me so long to feel comfortable with some of these ideas to execute on them. Whereas now I think that learning curve has been a lot shorter and I hope that we can make it even shorter so that people don't waste time getting to that tipping point of feeling comfortable. Andrew, can you share some of those strategies uh, in more detail? Because uh, for the listeners, I want them to know you legally, legally reduced your global tax rate from 43% to 1%. And how did you go about that exactly? Well, there's a couple different strategies and some of the strategies have changed in the last year or two. And and when we look at the four or five countries that, that we serve, I mean, there's things that are constantly changing. Generally speaking, there's two parts to going offshore. Um, for the average kind of small business. There's moving your assets and then there's moving your actual, your butt, your bum, your tukus, whatever you want to call it, right? Uh, and I like tukus, that's a good word. People should use that more <laughs> often. Um, so, you know, people will say, well, hey, um, I had I made a video about this. I, I had a couple, they said, uh, hey, we, we moved our business to uh, Hong Kong. We got a Hong Kong company, we signed some papers and we, you know, voila. Our business that sells stuff in Australia is now in Hong Kong. I said, well, that's fantastic. Um, but Australia doesn't really think that it's in Hong Kong. That's, that's like a controlled foreign company. So you guys need to be cutting your ties to Australia. So it's a matter of, you know, you not living in a high tax country and your business not living in a high tax country. There are nomads uh, who, yeah, I don't know, I'm not making so much money. I'll just keep my company in Australia, Canada, US, whatever. And they're just going to keep paying in that country. Um, so it's a matter of how do I find the right jurisdiction to incorporate my company? How do I make sure I'm following all the legal practices in terms of where's my staff, where are my customers, how am I warehousing my products, how am I shipping them, uh, what are the means through with them, which I'm selling them, um, you know, who's signing contracts, who's doing hiring, who's doing sales, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then, you know, physically where am I located? Who can claim ownership of me? Um, you know, ultimately for me, for a number of levels, not really, entirely related to, to financial reasons at all, but just related to personal reasons. I decided I don't want to even be tied to the United States at all. I gave up my citizenship. Um, most people don't have to do that. Um, but it's just a matter of, you know, who, who are you paying tax to personally? Where is your company paying tax? Um, that's the formula for the average person who's selling stuff through Amazon FBA, um, through Shopify, doing consulting, doing coaching, you know, whatever kind of nomadic businesses. On the other hand, you've got the guys, you know, someone came to me recently, he's got a home services company, kind of like the one I ran, uh, but he's in Australia. And so his thing is, I've got workers in Australia, how do I move a good chunk of the operations overseas and then find a legal way to move that money back and forth while I'm running it, you know, overseas. So there's different ways to do it, but it comes down to where are you taxed? Where's your business taxed? Yeah, it makes it makes perfect sense. One thing that you mentioned, and I think it's kind of your motto or your logo, Andrew, that you go where you're treated best. Uh, where are some of the places, and and that makes sense as also a nomadic entrepreneur. Uh, there's a lot of places we can go to either live or just travel or to use geo arbitrage and let our dollars uh, maximize our lifestyle for a lot less in other countries. So where are the, some of the places that you favor that you feel you're treated the best? Well, I'll tell you, I mean, go where you're treated best. It's my five magic words, I call it. And I was just talking to someone today uh, who was asking me about the dating scene. And, you know, go where you're treated best doesn't just have to be about money or tax. What I've done in my life to answer your question is I've tried to nail it down uh, my life to be a bit less nomadic, uh, to build up my team, to handle some of the travel. And I've tried to put it in what I call the trifecta. Where do I want to live? Well, I want to live in Malaysia because it's a tax-friendly place and it's a very Western place, very well connected. I can get everything I want. Um, I can get a visa without having to do a bunch of uh, schlepping. Um, I'm in Montenegro in the summer. I think it's a great, that whole region is underrated for hiring the, the Balkans. 
uh, and, and uh, a bit further east of Caucasus. Um, I think it's underrated, you know, very easy to buy property, very easy to do deals, um, low taxes, um, rather simplified tax code if you wanted to live there full time. Uh, and I'm looking for some other places. You know, I've been a big fan of Georgia. I think it's very easy to bank in Georgia. I've, you know, done real estate investments there. It really depends on what you're looking for. Um, but those are places that I've enjoyed investing and living and being. I think there's a lot of great potential in Colombia. I think that'll be the number one free economy in South America in coming years. But it really depends on, you know, what do you want? If you're just trying to save on tax, you know, what's the best tax haven that serves your type of business? If you're looking for a place to live, you know, perhaps Malaysia and Asia, um, you know, Mexico, Colombia, I like a lot. Um, Eastern Europe, you know, those are places that I think check the box. But, you know, if you're looking to invest, you know, how are you looking to invest? I think that everyone's go where you're treated best is going to be highly specialized uh, to them and their needs. And so it's hard to come on a podcast and say, everyone should just go to Armenia. Um, which I think is actually going to be an up and coming place in the next two years. Um, but those are some of the places where I'm living and investing. And, and from like creating a company, like if you imagine you have a Shopify uh, yeah. company or a FBA or a blog, mm -hmm. blog where making money, where according to, to you, uh, you should incorporate such a company. Well, obviously, this is what I do for people, and there's a lot of nuance. I mean, people like Hong Kong. Uh, some people complain, oh, it's too expensive. I think that's kind of silly. You know, I mean, I think that there's, in, in today's world, um, I think that onshore is going to be the new offshore. Um, you know, I'll tell you where I wouldn't go. I wouldn't be going to the Seychelles. I wouldn't be going to Belize. I know that there are people, including some friends of mine, who recommend places like that because from a tax perspective, purely it works. Okay, well, that's great. Good luck getting a, a bank account that's decent. Um, you know, even if you're using kind of one of these two-part structures, I mean, it just doesn't really work the way I want it to work. So I like kind of hybrid onshore, offshore jurisdictions. Um, I don't mind doing the extra work in a place like Hong Kong. Um, I don't mind, you know, going through audits and doing stuff like that. So my advice is that the world is shifting away from zero tax, zero paperwork, zero anything. Um, those are what I would avoid. And if I could find a place like a Hong Kong, uh, for some people, the United States is a tax haven. Um, not for a U.S. citizen, but if you're a non-U.S. citizen, you know, that may be decent. Now, I don't think for a multi-million dollar business having what I would call a naked LLC in the United States, the kind that like, I think Stripe has some kind of service for that. I don't like that. I don't think it's very sophisticated. Again, it may work for certain people from a pure tax perspective, but it doesn't really work for asset protection. If you're selling an FBA, someone chokes and dies on your toy or whatever. I mean, you know, um, it's, you know, for a lot of people, keeping all their money in the United States is not really... Um, what they're looking to do. Um, so it depends on who you are, but those are probably two countries that I think make a lot of sense depending on who you are, the Hong Kong and the United States. But my main thing is, um, you know, I made a video on the cheapest places to incorporate offshore and my personal experience setting up companies in those places. It's a lot of work. It's so, a lot of work, yeah. And, and it's sometimes like, especially Hong Kong, they're yeah. becoming more and more uh, like challenging with the, the documents and the and the uh, KYC and and, sure. and AML procedures. What do you think? Like rising countries like like Estonia and Georgia to set up there your holding. What's your yeah, I mean, I, I mean, what I would say is, I mean, why Estonia? Why Georgia? I mean, I think Estonia has been an incredible marketing product, and I I give the government a lot of credit for for being open and for being um, for doing a great job. I think Georgia has been an extremely efficient government and I, um, you know, I mean, know a lot of people there and, and I believe it's a great place, but you know, generally speaking in these places, I mean, there's eventually going to be a tax requirement. Um, and so you can defer tax. I mean, there's tax deferral and there's just, you know, low tax. Um, so, you know, for me, you know, I like to focus on where am I going? What problem am I trying to solve? Okay, I'm in the United States, I'm in Australia, I'm in Canada, whatever. I'm paying a lot of tax. I want to solve that problem. If I can go to Hong Kong and solve that problem and I can get, um, you know, my, I, can, I can do that at a sophisticated level in a way that it gives me more options and more flexibility um, than an Estonia or a Georgia and that saves me money above those places in the long run. I'm going to deal with the forms. Now, understand, I mean, kind of my minimum bar for entry is you're making 300 grand and, and that kind of goes up every year. 
Um, so if someone's doing 50 grand a year, okay, maybe it's not worth it. If it's 50 grand a year, maybe focus on getting it up to the 300 before you do this. But um, I don't see form filling as an issue. I see it as a pain. I see it as something that can be outsourced. I see it as something that you're going to be doing everywhere eventually. Um, so to me, the, the better question for that person is, how do I get my business to a bigger level where I'm just going to have people doing this for me um, rather than avoiding the unfortunate but manageable side effects of the solution that serves my needs the best? Because here's, here's the reality. The world is going to become more compliant. Every year, its options are being closed down. Residence programs are becoming more expensive. Tax residence options are going away. Citizenships and naturalization are becoming more difficult. Um, you know, it's, you know, company registers are opening up. Um, banks want more documentation. FATCA, now CRS. It's a growing list up to 110 uh, countries now in 2020. It's the world has changed, and so for the people who think I'm just going to hang out in Bali 12 months a year, they don't really know that when that I'm here, and they all attack. Okay, good luck with that. Good, no, seriously, I mean, good, good luck with that. This hiding, how are they going to know? What should they? It's over. It's over. Get used to paperwork. Um, and to me, I mean, the EU and the direction that they're going. Uh, I do like Estonia a lot. I just think that the EU has a lot of nonsense involved with it. Um, if I'm a European citizen, maybe it's worth it for certain types of businesses. I don't really work too much with Europeans. I just think get used to paperwork. The days of BBI company, and I've had, I think, some of your your listeners. I mean, I know one guy we we know through the, the grape, grapevine, nice guy, came to me and said, yeah, I get my BBI company. My bank closed me down. Um, really? Because they're like, hey, man, this big you know, you know, sophisticated, great global bank. Fantastic. I, I use them. And they're like, yeah, we don't want these companies where you just do nothing anymore, where there's no paperwork, not enough paperwork for us, basically. Yeah. Get used to more paperwork. I mean, that's just the way things are going. The United States introduced more paperwork for, for you know, Form 5472 now, if you're just owning one of these naked LLCs or you own it through a subsidiary uh, or, or through a parent company. Paperwork is the, way, is the place we're going. Um, you know, compliance, transparency, that's the way we're going more and more every year. Yeah, it, it's true. And I think, you know, the more interconnected we become, the more it's it's definitely going to lead that way for sure. You mentioned too that you obtained uh, some second, second or how many citizenships do you have, Andrew? I have a handful of them. I, I've talked about a couple that I got through investment. I've gotten others through through other means um, that I don't talk about so much. And I think it's probably a good idea for people to to keep some of their citizenships close to the vest or, or in their case, all of them. I, I talk about them because I want people to know that um, the opportunities are out there and I want to document and I hope to do that more with other things I do in the future. Um, but I've gotten a couple and I've, I've gotten a couple by investment. What are, what are a couple that you recommend? Well, again, it's different. So for example, I have this um, Australian guy here this week and you know, he doesn't have an immediate need because he's solved his personal tax residence problem. Right which is more challenging than it used to be. You know, you can't just not be in Australia six months and be there six months. That's over. Um, but he solved it. And so does he need a second passport? He needs it. If you're not a U.S. citizen, you need it to the extent that maybe other countries are going to start to go in the direction of the United States where they're going to start maybe not outright taxing your income, but they're going to say, hey, you know what? If you're living in Monaco, eh, we're going to tax you something. Who knows if that comes down the pike in the future, but it's quite possible. Uh, look at what the U.S. did with this thing called guilty, which is kind of related, where they're saying you have to pay something. So, you know, is that guy, is a non-U.S. citizen who's kind of taking out an insurance policy against some kind of higher taxes in the future going to rush to St. Kitts and Nevis and pay 150 grand uh, to get something in four or five months? No. Um, if you're an American and you're looking at an active insurance policy, then I think that that might be the best strategy. And it's hard for people to get their heads around just donating $100,000 or $150,000 plus fees. But if the ROI is there, then I think that makes a lot of sense. Because if you're a busy six or seven figure entrepreneur, you'll make it back in months or a year or whatever else. Uh, you know, if, if you're not, uh, you know, I think that, for example, Columbia has got a very interesting program. You invest in real estate and you can go camp out there um, one day every two years. 
Um, that's it. One day every two years. That's nice. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> now you're not going to get to the business option. Yeah. I've gone both routes. Um, and you know, this is the stuff for me, for me, it's mastery. I just like going in and digging my hands in there. But I think, you know, on the permanent residence route with Columbia, I think it's a very interesting one. Um, you know, Turkey just came up with a program. I know people may laugh, but you invest a quarter million dollars in real estate in Turkey uh, and you can get a citizenship. Now you're probably not going to renounce your current citizenship to be just Turkish, but as part of a portfolio, that could be interesting. Um, you know, if you have the money, Portugal, golden visa, the real estate's overpriced, but if you're willing to, you know, just let the income kind of pay you back on, on the real estate, uh, on the lack of gains there and, and the opportunity cost, then, um, you know, that could be interesting more and more. I mean, my strategy going forward is to put a little bit more money in and make your life a bit easier. Um, you know, these programs where you just kind of go and, and camp out in Mexico and get a residence and hope in five years you get a passport. I like that less and less because I'm seeing like what's happening in Panama where people were promised passports in five years that never came to fruition. Um, and so, you know, the Mexico's of the world could be a good backup plan to your backup plan. And, and sometimes I'll recommend that just to kind of build the portfolio. Um, but I am increasingly saying, put some money behind it. Um, that, that, that's where I'm going. And of course, if you have, you know, a parent or grandparent from somewhere, we, we've been helping people get to, we got UK, we got Italy, we got Ireland, we got, um, we almost have one approved in Hungary, Canada. I mean, if you have a parent or grandparent, just do that. I mean, get what's free. Um, but if you don't, I'm increasingly moving into the camp of make your life easier. Just put up some money and they'll roll the red carpet out for you versus making you wait around in offices that smell. Again, not, not, nothing wrong with that. And I'm doing some of that. I mean, I'm going down and I'm looking at investment in Armenia. Uh, they're looking at putting out a citizenship by investment program, but I'm looking to see, hey, you know, if I go and get residents in Armenia, um, you know, it, it's relatively straightforward and you can just put in, you know, like 20 grand, which is still something. It's not just you show up and beg for a residence permit. It's something and it's, you know, okay. Um, I'm working on that, but I wouldn't call that a guarantee. That's not really going to be guaranteed. It's still kind of like 50, 50, in my opinion, that that is going to work maybe better than 50, 50. But I think that, you know, if you're going to go that route, you need a couple different options and you need to treat them as call options rather than guaranteed strategies. Um, so hopefully, you know, Colombia, Turkey, Armenia, not both of those second two, but. Uh, and in Colombia, I heard that you don't even have to actually buy something, just transfer the money and then is that correct or. Yeah. Well, yeah. So again, here's what there is. There's, in Colombia, there's a couple of different programs and they've simplified it last um, November, 2017 or December. There's the, the about $23,000 where you start a business and that business could be in real estate. Uh, that's a 10 year naturalization timeline. And I, I don't believe that you're ever going to get naturalized that way. Uh, in fact, uh, I've been told uh, by people in the office that no, we're not going to do it. Um, the permanent residence way, can you put the money into something else other than real estate? Yes. I happen to like Colombia as an investment destination. I also think that, again, you have to look at these countries from the perspective of, you know, you get to apply in five years. They don't have to approve you. Like people imagine this is kind of like a rubber stamp procedure everywhere. It's not always that way. I mean, and, and it may be easier in Colombia than a Belgium, for example or than the United States, which is like the most difficult. Um, but if it's just like, hey, I just kept, you know, 170 grand in the bank for five years, I think that um, they're going to look askance at that. And so I'm sure you could find a lawyer who's, ah, oh, you know, sure, you know, the law, you know, the law says. But I can tell you, even in really efficient countries, people have discretion. And I can tell you, people use that discretion to A, um, treat people from countries they don't like poorly, like such as Indians, Chinese, what have you and to set special rules for them without actually having them codified in law. And number two, to reject people who haven't met the criteria. Perfect example, and people have criticized me for this, but it's true, and I know the people, multiple people, who met the letter of the law in Uruguay and were not naturalized because, you know, you know it's the letter of the law, but not the feeling of the law. You know, you weren't just supposed to put the money there and do nothing. You were supposed to 
you know, become part of our fabric. <laughs> and so that's somewhat subjective, but I can tell you this, if my strategy for getting a second passport, and increasingly I think that people, including non-US people, are going to be looking at second passports as a strategy for, as a tax insurance plan. I don't want to be waiting around for five years and putting out 170 grand I could deploy somewhere else only to be told, oh, you didn't become part of the fabric. So there's always going to be something that slips through the cracks. You know, what I try and do is study things on a street level and looking at historical data and looking at trends and seeing, you know, where are these countries going? Where's the global trend going? And so the, the, the short answer you know, to, to your question is, Yes, ostensibly you can do that. Um, I'm not convinced that in five years from now you're going to get the results that you want. And so that's why I come back to, you know, if you have the money, four, five, six months from now, you get the result you want. You get the passport if you pay more in one of these islands or Moldova now, Montenegro. Um, if you don't want to go that route, then you better be pretty darn sure that five years from now it's going to come to fruition. And five years is a long time. And um, I think a lot of things are going to change in five years. And I come back to compliance, transparency. You've got to tell a story. Yeah. Um, the story has to make sense, I guess, is, is, is the point, you know? People don't know, understand digital nomad. I mean, just talking to a guy in Brazil. It's like, if you <laughs> tell them, you, if, 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 it's like if you go to Brazil and you tell them, oh, I've got two citizenships, she's like, th their minds will explode. Like, don't right. ever tell them, don't ever tell them you got to just, just pick one that works and stick with that one. That's your story. You're from New Zealand. You're not from New Zealand, but you're no, no, New Zealand, New Zealand, New Zealand, New Zealand, New Zealand, you know, or whatever the case is, because they don't understand it. They can't even understand someone has two citizenships. Their parents were from two different countries. You know, you have to have a story. That's kind of the, the big thing that, that's the answer to all these questions. Why is your business in Hong Kong? You know, why are you banking with this bank? Why is this done this way? Why are you investing here? Why do you want this passport? That's funny because actually in Brazil is one of the few countries where you, if you adopt a child, you, you, can, you can get the citizenship, citizenship. No? Yeah, we just put an article at this. I think, um, I don't know, I wrote it a, a, a while ago, but uh, just the other day, how to get citizenship by giving birth in Brazil as, as, a, as an engaged person. Now, this is a thing that uh, I, I joked that I knew she was the one when I asked if, you know, could we give birth in Brazil? for that very reason. And she's like, sure. I'm like, okay, sure. I'm like, okay, we'll fly your mom in. We'll make it a whole thing. And um, yeah, you can adopt. But again, the issue is, um, you know, the devil's in the details. Are you willing to go and become a permanent resident? Again, nothing. I mean, the letter of the law is, is pretty quiet, but in Brazil, um, the feeling of the last six to 12 months is, uh, you really should be spending a pretty good majority of that year in Brazil if you want the bureaucrats to approve your case. So if you are like a, a nomad uh, a capitalist or for a digital nomad or in location independent traveler, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's great to, to implement, you know, uh, hire you, you know, implement your strategy, your advice, and then voila, uh, they have a second passport or a second uh, bank account and, and, uh, and free tax. <laughs> What, what if I'm a family? Imagine I have, a, I have two children, a wife. I mean, I can, uh, how do I do that? Do you have also these clients? Or? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that um, an increasing number of people are parents. Um, I have some folks who just came to me. It's funny, they were traveling for about five years and they gave birth to twins on the road. Um, and now they're trying to figure out where are we going to settle down. The principles don't change. And in fact, you know, having a family, having, a, you know, a spouse, uh, you know, in many countries, it, it should be a real spouse. A lot of people come and they say, oh, well, you know, I call her my wife, but we're just really, you know, two strangers in, in the night, according to Malaysia or Georgia or whatever else. So, but, you know, if you're legally married, if you have kids, if the kids are in school, I mean, those are all things that really help make your case, right? Um, those, those can help your tax case because it's like more connections to this low tax country. I think that where the industry is going, and as, as you can tell, I mean, there's so many things that are changing so quickly. For a family, yeah, you can pick one place. You can pick a zero tax place. You can pick a territorial tax place. I, mean, I think Malaysia is a great place, quite frankly. I don't know why more people aren't in Malaysia. And, and maybe I don't want the word to get out because I like just being here and, and you know, in a 
being left alone. <laughs> but I don't know why more people aren't in Malaysia. It's easy to get into. You can set up shop. It's rather Western. It's accessible to everywhere. And, you know, why not have your wife, your husband, your kids here with you? They have schools here. You know, I know a lot of folks uh, where I'm from don't realize, but they do have schools in other parts of the world outside of the United States. <laughs> um, children are being educated. So what I'm seeing is that you've got, whether married children or just single, people that I'm talking to who are at the, you know, the seven figure level, especially are saying, I just want that one place. You know, I'm seeing people who are just saying, I just, I just want to live like I'm married and have kids, even though I don't. So we're already plugging those strategies into single guys. We're just like, all right, just, you know, get your apartment in Malaysia, get set up here, get your base. There's your bona fide residence. There's your, there's your tax home. And, um, you know, voila, you're done. Oh, you get married. Great. Okay. You know, add her. Oh, you have kids. Okay, great. Send them to school. And then of course, you know, the whole separate conversation comes to, you know, one of these days we'll all get together and educate our kids together with tutors. And we're not going to bother sending them to some, you know, British school or American school. We'll just educate them the way we want. Like homeschooling or... Yeah, my editor wrote a book called uh, World Schooling. And there's different ways to do it. But I think that for me, if I had kids, uh, yeah, I think I would hire a couple tutors. And I would basically do homeschooling according to a curriculum. I'd have some elements of unschooling. And I would do... Um, you know, have the tutors teaching them, you know, whatever the curriculum is for that level, that's what they'd be learning. And then we'd, we'd be mixing in just the, the, the education of traveling around the world and seeing different cultures. Um, so, you know, I, I do hear people come and they say, Hey, you know, let's, let's just bag as much cash as we can for the next five years before we move back to wherever and, and start a family. Um, and I don't think it has to be that way. I don't think this should be like the stopgap. I think it can be the, a lifestyle that stays with you forever. And quite frankly, I think a lot more people are going to be living this lifestyle in years to come. It's just starting. Well, I, I get always the question about where to keep the gold, but maybe, maybe that's a question for later. Yeah, I think um, I like Asia. I think the world is shifting to Asia as a wealth hub. Um, if you look at investments, I mean, I like the Americas a lot. There's obviously a lot of immigration opportunities there. Um, when someone tells me, you know, Panama is the next big place, I, I just say anything in Asia will be Panama. Um, and to me, the Americas were never a place to store those kind of assets. Um, it was always Switzerland or Asia. I think that um, Switzerland has become a place with a lot of friction to wealth. Um, particularly if you're just, you know, a mere mortal, you know, with a million dollars or something. Um, and I think that, that um, you know, Singapore is probably the go-to place for storing hard assets, um, hands down. I want to shift the, the topic just a bit to talk a little bit more about um, your business and growing this business. And one of the things that I love that you do is you give 95% of your stuff away for free before you start even charging. And I'm curious, um, have you used this strategy in your other businesses or is this a new strategy or newer strategy that you're using and how has it played out for you? You know, the thing is, every time I start a new business, and again, I ran a couple of them concurrently, but every time I start something, a business, I will take away key lessons and I'll kick myself and say, if only I would have known that in the last business, you know, it would have been so much better, right? And so now I look back at the word that you guys use, which is a great word, which is influence. And I say, wow, I was not maximizing my influence in any of those businesses. Um, the reality is I started this thing and I didn't really know where I wanted it to go. Listen, of course I would like to have monetized it, but I figured it was going to go in a direction of kind of like writing books like Jim Rogers or something. I didn't expect it. It would be, you know, helping people actually do, you know, offshore strategies. Um, I mean, my goal when I actually registered the domain was how do, you know, I want to do a, a podcast so I can get like Kevin O'Leary on the show. How do I become big enough that like Kevin O'Leary will come on my show? I want to interview these shark tank guys. And so I never gave so much stuff away for free. Now, I mean, you know, when you're on a swimming pool business, I don't know what you're really giving people away for free. I mean, what <laughs> test your chlorine levels? I mean, okay, that's what you need to know. I don't know. Check your motor twice a day. I don't know. I, I still could tell you nothing about the pool business, but yeah, it was just me saying, you know what? Um, I want to share this with people. Now I, I pulled back a little bit in, in recent years, only in the sense of I've, I consistently and, and, and constantly gain a greater and greater appreciation for realizing that nuance matters, right? So 
when someone says, where's the best place to incorporate? You know, it honestly is hard to say. I can, I mean, I can tell you where, where I wouldn't, but it's hard to say, you know, for every listener, here's the solution. Then people go and do it and it doesn't work for them. I, I don't want that to be the case. Um, but, you know, for me, what I've just, what I've really focused on in the last year, especially is taking a step back and realizing that, you know, 98% of people where we're from haven't even heard of this stuff or they think it's illegal or they don't really know what's going on. It's true. And, and take a step back. I mean, I put out a video recently that did very well called does dual citizenship lower your taxes? Dual citizenship, unlike second passport, which is kind of like an industry insider, inside baseball term, dual citizenship, everyone knows dual citizenship. And that seemed to work because a lot of people who would never have been consumers of our content, they weren't looking for an offshore company. They weren't looking for the stuff. They were just scrolling around YouTube and they just saw just dual citizenship. Well, that's interesting. Let me check that out. Right. And what I've really decided to do is to kind of take a step backward and to try and bring more people into the tent. This whole industry up until, well, still, the whole industry, uh, as someone once told me, is a bunch of uh, you know, 60-year-old white guys fighting over a smudge on a napkin. The rest of the napkin is lily white and clean, and these guys are all fighting over the smudge when you've got an entire group of people who don't even know this is possible. They're sitting around debating, maybe I should move from California to Arizona to cut my state tax rate by 5%. And they're totally missing the biggest win that's in front of them. That if they can move to Arizona, they could probably move to Panama or, you know, become yeah. a nomad or whatever. Yeah. So that's really where I see the free part going is not drilling down to putting out the 19th piece of content this month on some new passport opportunity so that the same people can watch and nitpick and say, Oh, this one's not for me because I don't really like it. You know, it's, it's bringing more people in and helping people to discover what is possible. Um, and so that's really, I think um, a lot of us get into the kind of inside baseball stuff and it's worth taking a step back and it took me a while to figure that out. So Andrew, if somebody, if somebody is a successful entrepreneur already, but looking to grow their influence more, what are some of the, the steps? And I know you recommend giving a lot of your content or stuff away for free, but what are some other things that you would recommend or strategies that you would recommend? You know, I, I think that being a, a recent follower of, of Gary V, I and mean, I like the idea of, you know, day trading attention. You know, you look at Grant Cardone, you look at Gary V. These are guys who talk about, you know, you have to have people paying attention to you. Mm -hmm. I think that what a lot of us have gotten bogged down with is the idea of, well, maybe someone's not going to like me. And especially in my business. I mean, you know, I put out a video, does dual citizenship lower your taxes? I get a bunch of nasty comments about how I'm, you know, encouraging people to stop paying 50%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think if you don't want to pay 50%, you should find a legal way to not do so. I find nothing immoral about that whatsoever. Um, right. Yeah, or I, unpatriotic. They, they will find you unpatriotic uh, for doing that. And of course, it's totally ridiculous because, you know, all yes. my British and Australian and Canadian friends who have become taxed on residents and live in Dubai are heralded as heroes by their local embassy. They go in and they have tea and crumpets once a month. Meanwhile, I'm a, a traitor uh, <laughs> and people, uh, you know, want to tell me that I'm a scum and I'm a tax dodger. I mean, listen, uh, I don't live in the United States. I don't really want to live in the United States. And so therefore, it seems like why should I pay taxes in the United States? But to your more positive question about influence. Um, you know, I think that what I have, you know, what I'm trying to do is find the platforms where, you know, I can build influence with people who are looking for my service. Uh, and with more importantly, people who are underserved by the service. Um, the guy who I am, you know, here with this week, um, is a bit older. He's, um, you know, in his sixties and that's not the kind of people that I typically reach. Um, he's a very successful guy. Um, but what I feel is helpful to my influence was kind of, again, stepping outside of that box where everyone else was talking to the retiree who had half a million bucks in an IRA and they figured they could get them down to a conference, you know, in Belize or Costa Rica, whatever, and just have them, you know, move the, the whole IRA into some offshore IRA and buy some crappy real estate and open some account at a little fly spec bank and, um, you know, do that. 
and nobody was talking to the, the 29 year old who's making a million dollars in FBA. If you want influence, I think that you have to blaze a trail to people who are seeking that influence. And now that I've done that, I hear people saying, I never even heard about this before you were talking about it. You know, it's a lot easier to be influential when you do that versus when you're trying to be the 19th person telling a retiree uh, that they should move to Costa Rica. <laughs> no, actually, it's funny that you that you spoke about uh, about uh, Shark Tank uh, or Gary V or, or Grand Gardon. All these guys actually have a what I discovered a, a mastermind group uh, where. Uh, well, I, I think except Gary Vee, but m most of the guys have a mastermind group uh, where you can uh, access actually to them, uh, have easy access to their uh, network. And, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people, as you said, you know, in, in the beginning of uh, the podcast, a lot of people uh, are, uh, um, I don't know exactly the right English word, but like stingy about their own education and about their own, let's say, network education. And I think that uh, if you want to uh, top up your game, as you said, uh, uh, you definitely have to have this visibility and much easier to have that visibility by association. So I, I totally agree with you. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think that, I mean, I absolutely agree. I think that, you know, for me just to go out and just to try and, you know, be next to Grant Cardone, you know, may not be the answer. I mean, I had, you know, when, back when I was doing conferences and I tried to do mine a bit differently, you know, we had Peter Schiff come to the very first one. By the time we got to the third and final one, the keynote was my father. And you know what? People who came to the, all three of them said, your father was the most interesting because he inspired all this and he told all of his thoughts about, you know, why we're all here. And so, you know, Peter Schiff didn't make me. You know, Jim Rickards, the second one, he didn't make me. Eventually, I just realized I have to, I have to be the influence uh, uh, generator. And, and to, your, to your point about, you know, investing, yeah, listen, I am intrinsically uh, a cheap guy. People don't necessarily believe that, you know, because I like to wear suits and, you know, you know, buy stuff. But, I mean, talk to my first business partner. I mean, you know, we'd sit around. <laughs> I'd be like, $92? What are you, what, what are we running a Congress? You know, we were paying $92 for something. <laughs> and now if I'm not hiring someone to help me with something for 30 or 40 grand, uh, you know, if a certain amount of time goes by, you know, several months, it's like, wow, I need to pay someone some big money to give me a kick in, in the butt. I, you know, I just recently went out and hired a mentor to deal with some more personal development stuff, which feeds into my business development stuff. And, um, you know, if I sat around and said, well, I don't know, this guy's just giving me common sense. Everything he's telling me is common sense. Well, yeah, but I wasn't doing it. And, oh, shoot, I'm, I'm paying him five grand a month. I better listen to him, right? It's not just me like debating in my head. So I, I'm absolutely about the investment. And I, and I've, and I've, I say that only because I was the guy who didn't for too long. Uh, and that's really helped me kind of grow things a lot faster and, and to believe in the power of, yeah, I, I can create an influence. I don't need anyone else to, to help. And I think that's where a lot of people get hung up is I need someone else to come in and help me or to do it for me. I can't do it on my own. You can, but you have to do what it takes. And you're like, uh, hindsight's twenty twenty. So looking back over your entrepreneurial career slash nomadic career um, and growing your influence the way that you are now, what would you have done differently? Well, with Nomad, I think, you know, with our content, I think that, um, you know, hiring someone and getting some mentorship early on would have been helpful to help me get to the point faster. I think that we've gone through phases. I mean, someone who's been around since 2012 would see, you know, different, you know, phases. Um, and I think there's a while when I tried to indulge, you know, a bit of the, you know, angry libertarian because, oh, that's what those people in the smudge are doing. Uh, I am pretty libertarian, but I'm also a pragmatist. And I also realized that sitting around and complaining about things doesn't solve anything. Um, that's how I've been successful all my life is just by going out and doing stuff. Um, and so I think that you have to be true to yourself. I know that sounds cliche, but you have to really understand yourself. You've got to be really self-aware and you have to, to bring that through. And I think that I wish that I just would have come out stronger uh, right out of the gate and just been like, here's my deal. And, oh, someone wants to tell me that, you know, taxation is theft and I'm a sucker for, for being pragmatic about it. Um, okay, great. 
<laughs> you know, uh, I, I think that being honest with who you are and where you want to take things and what's your direction, you set the tone. That is probably one of the biggest things um, that I've taken away is, is, you know, early on allowing people to kind of say, well, no, but you haven't thought about this and me saying, well, yeah, maybe you're right. And, and allowing yourself to be manipulated to do something that you really don't want to. Um, I think that really focusing on what you, where you do want to go and trusting your gut and being authentic is, is number one. Not that I was never, uh, not that I was ever inauthentic, but um, it wasn't really where I wanted things to go. It's just like, Oh, well, this is what people want to hear. Um, and I have that side, but it's not the side that really solves the problems. And I would have rather done more problem solving early on. Where, where do you get your information uh, and and I'm not talking about the information uh, about uh, how like how to get a visa or how to get a passport in a specific country. But like, where do you what what is let's say your favorite top three uh, books that inspired you more into to dive into this uh, part of your life? Like, except let's say Permanent Traveler maybe as an example, or like what what other books? Or that you that you think, hey, this, this is a good read for the for the audience. Well, again, I mean, I, I I was reading a lot of books. I mean, when I was that fourteen year old kid who had it all figured out in theory, um, you know, it was the Jim Rogers books. It was Adventure Capitalist. It was oh, yeah. Harry Dent, The Roaring Two Thousands. I mean, those were the things that really opened me up. You know, with my father's blessing, I've talked about him saying, "Go where you're treated best." That's where it comes from. Um, those are the books that really opened me up to, wow, this is possible. This is where I want to be. And then there was the lag of, well, hold on a second. You know, I'm a pretty smart guy, 21, making all this money. And then it just became more and more of the years. Um, and I kind of, you know, it, so the books didn't lead to the direct, you know, transformation. The idea had to be kind of dormant for a while. I'll tell you a book that, that I like that I, I know a lot of people have, have talked about which is The Subtle Art of Not Giving Enough. I read that about a year and a half ago, and it started me on the transformation to kind of the next phase of Nomad Capitalist, which is, you know, take some stuff off the menu. You know, In-N-Out is the most celebrated burger joint in the U.S. because they keep it simple. You know, they don't have salad shakers and McRibs <laughs> and, you know, uh, you know, 18 different kinds of McFlurries. They have a burger they have a cheeseburger, they have a shake, and they have fries. You know, <laughs> it's simple. Yeah. And I think that for me, um, you know, focusing on, yeah, oh, and again, this is kind of like where it's like, oh, well, there's, if, if I don't go to like Tajikistan to like report on the leading minus inve mining investments, there's going to be that one guy on YouTube who's going to say, you're a fraud. You haven't been to Tajikistan. I'm on to you, nomad. <laughs> and it's like, listen, Nobody gives an F about Tajikistan. Nobody cares, right? You know, my biggest influence is going to be staying in the places and focusing on building my network, building, you know, the business, building the influence, building my knowledge in places that matter. And that means less. And so that's a book that really inspired me to cut some of the clutter, to cut down from, you know, 32 countries. I think I was on four continents in about 22 days last year and the month I was listening to that book. Now, I mean, this year I'll probably be in 12 or 13 countries and most of them I'm deep, I'm going deep, deeper instead of wider. So that I would say is one of the better books uh, over the last 18 months. Excellent referral. And we're going to wrap up there. And Andrew, I just want to give you a huge thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much for sharing your tips and tricks and all your wisdom with us. If the listeners want to reach out and learn more about what you have going on, where's the best place they can do that at? Very simple, nomadcapitalist.com. We've got over 1,400 blog articles now. We've got um, on YouTube, just, you know, youtube.com slash nomadcapitalist. We're building up um, a lot of new videos going to be coming out. You can subscribe there. But, you know, when you talk about the content for free, you know, I, I imagine that 98% of people who go to our website will never have a use for exactly what it is that I offer. But what I would encourage people to do is just to go there and read. And by the way, Nomad Capitalist, the book on Amazon, where I kind of condense a lot of it um, into about 300 pages and, and give you a one-on-one -on -one beginner's view at it. So those are the three resources. You know, I, I'm, I'm targeting a very specific type of person, perhaps some of those are your listeners, but, you know, whether you want the entire package or whether you just want to cherry pick, um, 
you know, I hope that people will go and, and figure out something else, just open a bank account somewhere, go and look at Georgia, our media, you know, other places, you know, just so that's where they can go. And, and I hope that everyone will get something out of it, even if it's not the entire picture. Andrew, again, thank you so much for, for coming on the show and sharing all, all those tips with us. We really appreciate it. We're going to wrap up there and listeners. Thank you guys once again for hopping on and we'll see you all in the next episode. Goodbye, everybody. Hey listeners, thanks for joining us once again. We wanted to remind you about our high performance productivity coaching and our five, six, seven, and eight figure private masterminds. These are all designed for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs to help you scale rapidly and grow. Check out all the details at thebusinessmethod.com. That's thebusinessmethod.com. And we'll see you all on the next episode.